Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. We cover everything Major League from spring training to the World Series. We've got your favorite club covered from New York to Boston to L.A. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Another edition of the GSMC Baseball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. I appreciate you guys tuning in. It's Monday, November 23rd. Hopefully everybody out there had a great weekend. I know I myself, I enjoyed it. Here in the Northeast, we had a sprinkle of, uh, let's call it spring weather. Not quite summer, but hit the 60-degree mark one more time. So was able to get outside and enjoy it before the uh, Jack Frost winter season comes rolling in here after Thanksgiving and into the holiday season. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it out there watching football as well. Sunday night football wrapping up here as we're recording Chiefs and Raiders Going back and forth Sunday night, it's been fun. But uh, we got a great episode lined up for you here today. I'll be discussing the latest news, rumors, notes, everything going on uh, across the league here in Major League Baseball, keeping you guys up to date on the latest transactions or anything that's happening. Uh, Then we'll discuss the upcoming Rule 5 draft. Teams this past week had to add players to their 40-man roster to protect them from possibly being eligible for the draft. So we'll discuss the uh, top profile guys who are now protected and some other surprises uh, amongst the list as well. And then we'll wrap up the episode with the trip across the sea. We'll check in on the KBO and the Japan Professional League. Both of those are in their final series. You know, the, uh, what do we call it here? Gosh, I, I got to pull it up in front of me. It's the Korean series for the KBO. And then we have, oh man, the Japan series for the Japanese league across the sea. So we'll uh, we'll check those out, see what's going on. Since this is a baseball podcast, we're talking baseball all across the globe. You guys remember if you were listening during the pandemic just a few months ago or, or during the shutdown for Major League Baseball, I should say, since the pandemic is ongoing here. But uh, here we'll jump right in. Segment number one, talking news and notes across Major League Baseball. First up, uh, the uh, Toronto Blue Jays, or, you know, I'll just call them the Blue Jays since we're not exactly sure that they'll be back in Toronto next year, depending on how everything is going. They should be, uh, fingers crossed here, but uh, the Blue Jays are are joining the list of uh, teams interested in J.A. Happ. And Happ, of course, played for the Blue Jays previously. Uh, He had a couple of different times with the team. 2012 to 2014, and then once again, 2016 to 2018. So, uh, J.A. Happ, he's proven to be a kind of steady veteran uh, pitcher here nowadays. Since 2015, he has a 374 ERA and just about 900 innings. So, uh, he's certainly uh, effective once again, and he had uh, an ERA of 347. For the Yankees in 2020. So uh, the Blue Jays still interested in adding more pitching, even though they did sign Southpaw Robbie Ray, uh, re-signed him after trading for him at the deadline. And, you know, other uh, people in their rotation include Ryu, Roark, Pearson, Thornton, potentially Ray, maybe Hap. Uh, You know, they could be looking to keep Ray in the bullpen if they are able to add another starter. Uh, There's also rumors of the Angels potentially being involved with J.A. Happ. Uh, New general uh, general manager, uh, Maniasin, was with the Blue Jays both times that Happ was in Toronto as well. So there's a uh, connection with the Angels and Happ. Uh, But, uh, you know, certainly uh, looking to add starting pitching and J.A. Happ. We've heard his name uh, be mentioned a lot just due to his price and, uh, you know, what he's offered for that price. 
the past couple of years. But uh, another name floating around here right now is Rangers Lance Lynn. Is he going to be traded? What are they going to do? Uh, you know, he's been one of the most effective starters, uh, arguably could be called an ace in, in Major League Baseball. And, you know, honestly, since he signed with the Rangers, so over the past two seasons, he's first in Major Leagues with 292 innings. He's first in wins above replacements, according to fan graphs, at 8.3. Uh, he's fifth in swing and miss percentage, and he's 16th in strikeout rate so you know five pitchers 30 teams however many you know he's top 20 top 16 he's certainly uh ace worthy based on some of these numbers and you know for those of you at home who who haven't been kind of paying attention to Lance Lynn and you know how's he been doing this I remember him in Minnesota or even with the Yankees you know he was just okay well what happened is during his time in New York at the end of his tenure there He actually made an adjustment with where he stands on the rubber and he moved all the way to the third base side. So if you look at some graphs, do some digging online, you'll be able to figure out that uh, usually it was about, you know, two feet to the right of the rubber was his release point based on, you know, how his motion worked. And now since moving all the way to the right of the rubber, it goes up to almost two and a half, sometimes closer to three feet. And what he's also done in correspondence with this move to the right side of the rubber is he has abandoned his two seam or his sinker, and he has since been throwing his cutter more percentage of the time. Now he's still four seam about 50 to 55, but the cutter from 2018 has jumped from about 12% up to just under 25. And the two seam has fallen all the way from 40% down to about 17%. So he's moved to the right side of the rubber. He's working that cutter. And basically what you're seeing is as a right-handed hitter, that ball is starting kind of right at you or your head. And due to its trajectory to get on plane, plus the cut of the pitch itself, that thing just continues to just slide away from you the entire time, which makes it a difficult pitch to square up and a difficult pitch you know, to uh, hit for power. And then from the left-hand side, it continues to ride in. So you either have to pull your hands in, but then you'll struggle to keep the ball fair, or it's going to get in on you and break a lot of lumber, and you're going to have firewood going against Lance Lynn. So, you know, what does Texas do? They could sign him to an extension. I don't see that since he's going to want a ton of money. And based on the timeline of their rebuild, it certainly doesn't look like that aligns. You know, they could sit on him for a year, and then he leaves in free agency after declining a uh, a qualifying offer so they would get draft pick compensation or they could move them this year, this offseason or this trade deadline. And I do believe that third option would certainly make the most sense for them. And uh, a few teams that have been mentioned, mentioned as a potential destination for Lynn has, uh, you know, the San Diego Padres since they lost Clevinger for the year. Uh, Denelson Laments had some arm issues last year. You could potentially put him at the top with Paddock and Davies. Uh, the Chicago White Sox are out there looking to pair him with Giolito, Dallas Keuchel for another year or two. Uh, the LA Angels always looking for pitching, trying to make the playoffs for the first time in a number of years. Uh, you have Toronto, who I just mentioned, is looking for starting pitching. And then the Atlanta Braves are an outside contender. Uh, Mike Soroka, he's coming off an Achilles tear. You know, how limited is he going to be? Is he going to be 100% when he gets back? Is Ian Anderson going to be able to replicate his success? Uh, they signed Drew Smiley, but, you know, is that the upgrade that they were looking for? And then some other outside-the-box contenders, the Cubs, always going to be mentioned, the Yankees, the A's, Tampa Bay, uh, basically everybody would be up for Lance Lynn, and it's just a matter of packages in return to Texas. But I do think we see him moved. I'm not sure if it's going to be this offseason or next summer, but certainly I don't think we'll be talking this time next year, and Lance Lynn will still be a member of the Rangers. So uh, what else has happened here? Oh, we haven't discussed it since last time, but the New York Mets, Robinson Cano, suspended 162 games for performance-enhancing drugs, and uh, this is his second time being suspended for PEDs, hence the full 162 suspension, and the third time, I believe it's three strikes and you're out, and uh, we can get into a discussion based on 
you know, what uh, the, the uh, repercussions and if the penalties are harsh enough because he still has three years left on his deal. So, yes, he does forfeit $24 million this year, but those following two years are still guaranteed at that money level. So, you know, should he forfeit the rest of his contract? Again, there's a lot to discuss there that, uh, you know, during the offseason, Maybe I'll pick out a segment and we'll uh, kind of talk through both of those talk tracks. But uh, either way, the Mets now have an extra $24 million to spend here in 2020. Uh, there's rumors on how they're going to use that, whether it could be a uh, top free agent, Springer, Rio Muto. Uh, there's talk internally about potentially using that money to extend uh, Michael Conforto, who they took 10th overall back in 2014. Uh, he's been very good for them, so they could use it towards uh, Conforto. There's also talk about renegotiating with Jacob deGrom because he has an opt-out coming up after the 2022 season. So you could transfer that money over, kind of guarantee him more uh, 10-year terms, dollars, all of that stuff to keep him ha- uh, keep him happy and-, and avoid that opt-out potentially here in a couple of years. So uh, the Mets could go a lot of different ways, but just more money uh, available on their books now to potentially make a move. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Washington Nationals, they've been coming up in uh, quite a few different rumors, actually. Uh, the first one is uh, potentially being interested in Chris Bryant, the Cubs' third baseman, who we spoke at length about uh, last episode while talking about Theo Epstein stepping down from the Cubs and all the decisions that he will have to be made. But uh, the Cu- or, excuse me, the Nationals, their third base position, after losing Anthony Rendon, they, they really struggled over there in the hot corner. Uh, Yes, Chris Bryant didn't have a fantastic year, but certainly uh, a previous MVP back in 2016. And uh, everybody knows that uh, if he figures things out, he could be a top performer over there again. So uh, the Nationals, they're looking to move, uh, you know, potentially for Chris Bryant. Uh, One of their top prospects could move over to second base. I can't remember his name right now. I apologize, but uh, they could certainly make things work when it comes to the roster. And then also the Nationals show an interest in DJ LeMahieu. So if they can't sign or trade for Chris Bryant, they could potentially reach out in the free agency uh, period to DJ LeMahieu and put their name in the hat with the Mets and Yankees and uh, other teams who we've seen be rumored to sign LeMahieu. Another rumor that's floating around here and, uh, you know, something of interest when I saw the headline, uh, I wanted to dive into it in a little bit more detail, but uh, the L.A. Dodgers remain interested in trading for Nolan Arenado and How could that even be possible, right? They acquired Mookie Betts not even, what, 10 months ago now, last offseason. They then signed him to a 360-some million dollar deal for the next decade plus. And, uh, you know, they have this high payroll. How could they potentially afford Arenado? Do they even have the pieces to get it done? And, you know, the short answer to all those questions is, yeah, they, they do have the room and they do have the prospects. Now, is an in, uh, in-division in rival going to want to trade Nolan Arenado to the Dodgers? Uh, immediately, you would think no. But then as you continue to dive a little deeper, this could potentially make more and more sense because the Rockies, yes, they remain open to potentially dealing Arenado. And this is uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that he has an opt-out clause after the 2021 season. And when he re-signed with the Rockies for that big deal, there was talk of they're going to be competing every year. They had just come off a playoff appearance. And since then, obviously, they have not been very good. So, you know, he, he could opt out and, and look for that next big payday. And, and based on his performance in 2020, I don't think his street value has decreased at all. I know he's due $164 million on the tail end of that deal, but... I think he would at least get that on the open market next year. So an opt-out certainly seems more probable than not when it comes from Arenado's side of things. So when you're looking at it from that perspective, if you're the Rockies, okay, maybe we do move him for some return here. Now, why would it be the Dodgers? Because, again, potentially if Arenado opts out after this next year, the stars could align for him to just sign with the LA Dodgers because yes, there's a ton of money, but you know, with uh, money coming off the books over the next couple of years, upwards of, uh, you know, roughly $70 million. I mean, you're talking about Clayton Kershaw, Kenley Jansen, Corey Seager, Chris Taylor, 
All of those guys clear the books following the 2021 season, and that's more than enough money to uh, you know throw Arenado's way. Right now, making $35 million a year, you could certainly pencil that in and stay under the tax that they're looking at. So if you're the Dodgers, do you wait and try to play that side of things? Do you potentially re-sign Justin Turner for just one season? Because you paid him $20 million last year, transitioning Arenado's 35 onto the books wouldn't be that big of a problem, even if it was for next summer. But if you're Colorado, who would you be looking for coming back? Uh, Of course, you would go right to the young stable of arms that the Dodgers have. Uh, Dustin May, Tony Gosselin, Broussardo Gratterall, Mitch White. You know, you would probably look at at least two of those four to start with. Gavin Lux could potentially also be involved in the conversation. So there are pieces from L.A. side of things that could get the conversation going with bringing Arenado to town. It's just a matter, again, if the rivals of the Rockies and the Dodgers want to do business because the Dodgers, they could continue to go for this dynasty. They're looking to add a right-handed power hitter to the middle of that lineup to continue into the next phase uh, of the uh, Dodgers overhaul and and continuing into the future. So uh, they're certainly interested in Arenado. It'll just be a matter of if they're able to, uh, you know, come to some sort of agreement. But uh, a couple final thoughts here. Let's see. Nelson Cruz, uh, he's going to wait a little bit to sign a contract. He's trying to figure out how things are going to look next summer before ultimately he signs on the dotted line. And uh, more and more by the day, It does look like George Springer is done in the city of Houston. Uh, Quite a few local writers are coming out day by day and discussing how they don't think Springer will return and Houston's looking elsewhere to utilize their capital. But uh, that'll do it here for the first segments of the GSMC Baseball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. We'll step aside right now for a word from one of our sponsors and our sister shows, but When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the Rule 5 draft. What's that all about? Stick around. Find out. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. to another edition of the GSMC Baseball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. If you guys haven't checked this out on social media yet, please do me a favor. Head to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Check out the GSMC Podcast Network. Heck, they're even on LinkedIn. So you can head over that way and check us out there as well. Also, uh, follow us on Twitter. Like I said, Facebook, the GSMC Baseball Podcast. Two different pages, the Podcast Network. They'll keep you up to date on everything going on across the entire network, all the different shows. And then, of course, the Baseball Podcast will keep you guys up to date on everything going on across Major League Baseball. But uh, jumping back into today's show here in segment number two, we're going to talk about the Rule 5 draft. Teams had to make some decisions this past Friday when it came to 40-man rosters. And what does all this mean? So uh, let me break it down here a little bit. It still may seem kind of confusing, but I'll try to explain it here. So players first signed professionally at the age of 18 or younger must be added to the 40-man roster, essentially the major league roster, within five seasons, or they become eligible to be drafted by other organizations in the Rule 5 process. And other players who are also eligible are players that are signed at 19 years or older. They have to be protected within four seasons. So if you're under 18, it's five seasons. Over 19, we got four seasons. And what happens after the draft? Well, the team that drafts you pays $100,000 to the team that you were originally a part of, and you need to stay on the major league roster for the entire season. And if you'd prove not to be worthy 
of a, a roster spot for the entire season, you are offered back to your original team for fifty thousand dollars. So the original team gets a hundred grand. The player gets a tryout. If they don't make it, they essentially get shipped back for fifty grand. And that team that first had the prospect is sitting there fifty thousand dollars richer, and you know, worse no worse for wear. So uh, it, it's basically a process for the players that are buried behind, you know, standard major leaguers or, or, you know, Hall of Fame major leaguers. Like, think about the shortstop who was playing behind Derek Jeter for all those years at AAA for the New York Yankees, right? He's not going to get a shot to play shortstop for the Yankees. So if he's buried in the minors for more than four seasons, we get another team to essentially give him an opportunity and allow him to show himself where he would not be able to if he would just play his full 10-year career in AAA for the Yankees. So uh, I do like this process. Now, uh, it's not uh, a ton of talent because, once again, if you are any sort of a uh, top prospect or one of the uh, minor league's top prospects, you are going to be protected and you are going to be added to the 40-man roster during the final deadline. And that's essentially what happens every year. So teams look at players and they say, hey, okay, coming into this offseason, there were 59 total out of the top 100 prospects that were eligible. And all 59, or no, not just this season, after, over the course of the past six seasons, excuse me, I read my notes wrong here. So all 59 have been protected. There were seven This season, there were 13 last year, eight the year before that, so on and so forth. So if you're a top prospect, if you're rated on any of these lists, you will be added to your team's 40-man roster. And even if you're part of the top 30 prospects within your minor league organization, usually over half of those get protected. So the people that are getting picked in these drafts are not top-rated talents. They're not uh, names that common fans are going to know. Uh, a lot of times it's a relief pitcher with high upside who maybe hasn't you know, reached his potential, hasn't been able to figure out the strike zone, and, and now you know, with a, a move to another team who's not as good, they are potentially able to use them. And that's where it's also teams that aren't very good at the major league level are usually ones that uh, utilize the Rule 5 draft because they're not going to win a lot of games anyway, so they have the the option or the depth to add one of these prospects from another organization. So with all that being said, with all that confusion, I may have just laid on you guys there. Uh, Let's look at, uh, you know, list by list, team by team, to see who could potentially, you know, be drafted or be utilized because, you know, looking at the top 30 prospects uh, of each organization and who was eligible and who remains uh, a potential candidate to be drafted, you know, on a later episode here, I'll give you guys maybe a prediction on if I think a couple of guys go, but uh, the Diamondbacks, they added all four of their top 30 prospects uh, who were eligible this year. Uh, The Braves only left number 25, Thomas Burroughs, a left-handed pitcher uh, available to the draft. Uh, The Orioles, they added five of seven in their top 30 that were available. They left number 26 and number 27, uh, Sedlock and Hanafi, out there to be eligible. But once again, those are further down the list to where it may not be worth bringing those guys into camp and potentially you know, wasting uh, $50,000 and just sending it to the Orioles. So uh, the Rospect, or excuse me, the, the Red Sox, they uh, they protected all six of their prospects. Uh, the Cubs, they protected their three. The White Sox, they left three of six. But number 25, 28, and 29 were some of the ones that they, uh, they didn't protect. Uh, the Cincinnati Reds had some decisions. So uh, they could potentially have a couple of guys picked moving forward. Uh, Jacob Heatherly, a left-handed pitcher, could be taken. Uh, Alfredo Rodriguez is another one that could be available. Uh, The Cleveland Indians, they protected their top guys. The Rockies, the Tigers, uh, the Houston Astros, they had their number 14 prospect who could be available in the draft. Right-handed pitcher Jose Alberto Rivera was somebody added to their 40-man roster or left off their 40-man roster so he could be picked up. Uh, The Royals, they added their eighth-ranked prospect, but Suli Matias 
an outfielder is a potential option in the draft as their 14th rated prospect who will be available. Uh, you also have the LA Angels. They left off, wow, they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine top 30 prospects, and they only protected two of them, leaving uh, a bunch of pitchers exposed to potentially be picked. Uh, number 12th rated prospect, Packy Naughton. Could potentially be picked up. Jose Soriano, a right-handed pitcher, and Oliver Ortega could also be moved in the draft. Uh, The Dodgers protected three out of their six that were available. Uh, The biggest one they left off the list was Omar Estevez, uh, second baseman shortstop, their 21st rated prospect. Uh, Next up, you have the Marlins. They protected both of their guys on the list. Uh, The Milwaukee Brewers left a couple of candidates out there. They protected number 4, 24, and 25 on their top-rated prospect list, but left off number 14, Zach Brown, a right-handed pitcher. So you could hear the name Zach Brown being called in the draft coming up. You also have the Minnesota Twins. They only protected two out of their seven top 30 prospects with Wander Javier, a shortstop being their top rated available prospect. Wander Javier, a shortstop. I think we're going to hear his name just based on the position call. Uh, The New York Mets, they left all six prospects off of their 40-man roster. I I don't know exactly what they're doing uh, in regards to leaving them available. I guess they believe all of these guys rated 14th or lower uh, would not be picked up in the Rule 5 draft, so they're taking a bit of a gamble when adding, uh, not adding any of those guys. Uh, The Yankees, they protected all of their top guys. Uh, The Oakland Athletics, they have Jordan Diaz, a third baseman, who could be available in the draft as their 12th rated prospect. Uh, The Phillies, they protected their number four, 13, and 15 rated prospects. Uh, But a couple of guys on the list who could be picked up is Eniel De Los Santos, a right-handed pitcher who's had some time in the big leagues, and uh, teams will have enough film and tape on him to be able to make a decision. And then uh, Jalen Ortiz, an outfielder who was signed internationally from the Dominican Republic for uh, a couple of million dollars as a 16-year-old, really hasn't panned out here in the minor leagues thus far. Uh, Yes, he does have light tower power, they like to say. The guy could hit for... You know, hit the ball for a uh, far, far away, but uh, has trouble making contact and strikes out a lot. So uh, somebody could take a swing at that, maybe getting him into camp, working with him with the uh, the potential and the power there that could be intriguing. Uh, you have the Pittsburgh Pirates. Their 19th rated prospect, Santiago Flores, is up for grabs and uh, potentially could be uh, picked up in the draft here in the next couple of weeks. The Padres, they protected number eight and number 10 which leaves number 17, Tirso Ornales, an outfielder potentially exposed to the draft. And then we have the San Francisco Giants. They only had three guys. They protected all three on their top 30 list. Uh, The Seattle Mariners protected four out of their five guys. The St. Louis Cardinals, they left Julio Rodriguez, their 15th rated catcher or 15th rated prospect, who is a catcher, uh, available. The Tampa Bay Rays protected two of their four. Uh, The Rangers did all three of theirs. The Blue Jays protected their top picks. And then the same with the Nationals. But there were also uh, some guys who were protected and added to the 40-man roster that weren't on any of the organization's top 30 lists. So uh, there are some guys out there who, you know, internally are, are viewed much higher in a much higher status than those across baseball. And, you know, across the entirety of all 30 teams, 86 players, again, were uh, were added to 40-man rosters that were not on the top 30 list. So uh, let's see. Wandeson Charles, a right-handed pitcher for the Athletics, uh, talking about kind of the top 10 here, the surprises. I put together a list of guys, uh, you know, whose names I recognize, but, again, weren't top prospects but again, are viewed highly within their own teams. And uh, Waddison Charles, right-handed pitcher for the Athletics. Uh, He was signed out of the Dominican Republic in 2015. Uh, He's a 100-mile-an-hour guy, uh, slider, splitter, uh, but he's just he doesn't miss bats. He, he hasn't done it, you know, above double A. He also has a bunch of walks. So uh, the A's left him unprotected a year ago, but I guess saw enough uh, enough progress this past year where they protected him this time around. Uh, next, you have Sam Clay, left-handed pitcher of the Nationals. Uh, he was out of Georgia Tech. He became a free agent this past offseason. 
uh, but signed back with the Nationals and uh, now added to the 40-man roster. So from the left side, low 90s guy, uh, big ground ball pitcher, certainly Washington looking to hang on to pitching. You have Lucas Gilbreth, a lefty for the Rockies. Uh, he went to college at Minnesota. He was drafted in 2017. Uh, he struggled as a high ERA, but you know hit 100 miles an hour recently. Works mid to high 90s, so uh, they see the potential from the left side hitting triple digits. And yeah, those are the type of guys that get picked in these Rule Five drafts. The guy with the high level talent that one coach just looks at and says, "Yeah, throw him 100 grand. I think I can get this kid in the strike zone." And I think we can get him working here. So uh, Ernie Clement from the Indians, a shortstop. Uh, He went to Virginia, won a World Series there. Uh, Former fourth round pick. Uh, Let's see here. He's a big contact guy. No swings and misses. Uh, Speed, defense, versatility. Uh, Just another kind of all-around team guy that uh, certainly with the Indians and the the unforeseen future of Francisco Lindor, uh, they're going to hang on to shortstops within their organization to see ultimately – Uh, if they'd be able to replace him moving forward. So uh, for the Mets, Sam McWilliams, uh, he was a minor league free agent this offseason. He had a huge ERA in AAA, but high 90s fastball. Uh, He uh, was recently uh, picked by the Phillies way back when. So then he was with the D-backs, the Rays, the Royals. So my man's been traded a bunch of times. Nobody's been able to figure it out, but he's got all the goods to potentially put it together and and help out uh, the New York Mets. So The Indians also added Eli Morgan. Uh, He doesn't look good or jump off the paper when I say that. Below average fastball, but, you know, he continues to get outs. He continues to be effective and just one of those guys where, you know, analytics be damned. This guy just gets outs for him. Uh, The Dodgers protected Zach Rakes. Uh, He walked on at Kentucky and then uh, improved himself all the way to a 10th round draft pick. So uh, he's hit almost 300 between double A and triple A last year. Had a fantastic year. So the Dodgers potentially see him as a piece moving forward. Uh, You then have Drew Stroatman, right-handed pitcher for the Rays. Uh, He was a fourth round pick out of St. Mary's. Uh, He underwent Tommy John, but since then has bounced back strong. Mid-90s fastball plus breaking ball. Uh, So they wanted to hang on to him, didn't allow him uh, to reach the market here. And then lastly, Mason Thompson, right-handed pitcher for the Padres. You know, once again, Tommy John in high school, didn't really throw as a senior, uh, picked him early in the draft. He struggled with ERA, control, injuries since he's, uh, you know, been signed professionally. But upper 90s guy, six foot seven, and that stuff jumps off the page when it comes to the Rule 5 draft. So uh, we'll look into more detail who could potentially be picked and where over the next couple of weeks. But, uh, you know, a bunch of teams made some decisions. So check out your local rosters and you'll see a few new names on the 40 man pool moving forward. But. Uh, That'll wrap it up here for the second segment of the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. We'll step aside one more time here for a word from one of our sponsors and one of our sister shows, but uh, when we come back, we'll have ourselves some fun. We'll jump across the sea, check out the KBO, the Japan National League. They're, uh, They're both in their finals. We'll talk about how they got there, what's going on, so stick around, everyone. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. We'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Thanks again, and welcome back to the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. As I'm recording here late Sunday night, watching the Raiders and Chiefs, the Raiders out to an early lead. A couple of scores from Derek Carr through the air. Having some fun here watching football. And if you guys are into uh, other sports, other hobbies, check out the other podcasts within the network. I know I talk to you guys all the time, but there's fantasy football podcasts, NFL, college football. If you're into basketball, NBA free agency has been coming at you hot and heavy. The Sixers, my guys locally making some trades. Moving on from Al Horford, Josh Richardson, adding Dwight Howard, Seth Curry. I like it, man. I like the move. So if you want to hear more about hoops, check out the basketball podcast. And if you're not a sports guy, you're like, Kev, all I like is baseball. I'm not really into much else. Well, check out the news podcast. Check out politics, relationships, books, whatever it is across any function, whatever hobby, whatever it is. Again, we got a podcast for you with some very talented hosts who are bringing you guys great content on a regular basis. So how do you get to that? Wherever you're listening to this, I don't know, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Play, uh, you know, Google Play, whatever it is, there's a bunch of them out there. So type in GSMC into the search icon and all the different podcasts will pop up. As a matter of fact, while you're there, click on our show, hear the baseball podcast, give us five stars, write a review. Those go a long way in helping us continue to grow and continue to spread the love here. But, uh, Let's jump into some KBO conversation. Korean baseball uh, across the league here. 144 game season. They were able to get that concluded. And as of now, they are in the playoffs because I I talked to you guys about the KBO pretty regularly uh, while we were on the shutdown in April, May, June, uh, throughout the course uh, of the summer months. So uh, let's reset. Let's touch base. Let's try to figure out what the heck's going on here. And uh, there is a 10-team league in the playoffs. This is where things get interesting, because I didn't even know this when I was talking to you guys about it earlier this year, where five out of 10 teams qualify, but in order of ranking one through five is the number of buys that you receive all the way through the playoffs, right? So there's a wild card, a semi-playoff, a playoff, and then the Korean series. So... Teams four and five play in the wild card. The winner of that plays the three seed in the semi-playoffs. The winner of that plays the two seed in the playoffs. And then the winner of that plays the one seed in the Korean series. So what is your prize or what is the benefit for winning the regular season of the uh, KBO? Well, it's three round by all the way to the finals. And now you only got to win one best of seven series to win the entire championship. So there's the discussion, right? Maybe we'll have a little bit of this talk right now, but Major League Baseball talks about expanding the playoffs, adding more games, adding more money, and that's where I don't think this style of playoff would ever transfer to Major League Baseball, even with the expansion of teams because each game in the postseason is dollars going in the pockets of Major League Baseball, of the owners, of everybody on that side of the organization. Because, again, the players, they don't get as much of that cash in the playoffs. They're playing for the ring at that point. So the uh, Major League Baseball is not going to say, hey, let's add 10 teams, and then we'll give the number one seed uh, two round buys into the semifinals because they're going to make them play those games, and they're going to try to get the uh, – the, the money that comes from having those games. So it's a very interesting way to look at things because if you do win the regular season, like the Los Angeles Dodgers, right? It, it say it would have been a 162-game season. They go 120 and 42. And, and besides being the best team ever, what is their benefits? Well, they get home field advantage in a best of three or a best of five. They, they don't even start up one game to zero or or two games to zero, having to have the other team come back twice because that's another thing that happens in the KBO. This series starts with a 1-0 advantage for the team that's a higher seed. So the wild card, the five's playing the four, it's a best of three, and the four seed's already up one nothing. So the five has to beat them twice. Same thing with the semi-playoff. The three seed's up one nothing. The four or five seed would have to beat them twice. 
Then you get to the playoff or the semifinals, and that's a best of five. But still, the two seeds up one nothing. Then you go to the finals. The one seeds up one nothing. It's just it's fascinating how they do things over there. And I do think there's potentially a middle ground that could benefit you being the best team during the course of the regular season because fans of baseball love to have the conversation of it's a marathon not a sprint. It matters over 162. That's why we don't want to expand the playoffs because we get to the final four throughout the 162. But the more you expand the playoffs, the more you say, hey, Dodgers, congratulations on winning 115 games. Your reward is uh, home field against the eighth seed who could potentially have two stud starters. You have an injury and all of a sudden you're out in the first round. And I mean, it hasn't happened in baseball, but you don't have to look too far back in the NHL. I mean, look at the National Hockey League, not in 2020, but in 2019, the Tampa Bay Lightning were the top seed in the Eastern Division after winning, you know, the the award for most points. They had the best record. They got swept in the first round by the eighth seed. They were out in four games. They ran into a team that was extremely hot and got beat because they had a bad week. Literally, they had a fantastic six months, found themselves having a bad week, and were eliminated from the playoffs. So is the benefit of winning the regular season enough? I don't know, but uh, I certainly don't think you should get buys all the way into the final. So uh, let's see here. Looking at the matchups, your your fifth-ranked team was the Kiwoom Heroes. They finished this year 80-63-1, uh, and one, it, it looks like, potentially getting rained out. The LG Twins, they finished in fourth place at 79-61-4. and four. So this is based off a winning percentage and head-to-head records here, but uh, the Twins were uh, winning percentage points ahead of the Key Womb Heroes. So the Twins, they had a one nothing lead in the series to start. They ended up winning that first game to advance to face on the three-seed Doosan Bears, who had an identical record of 79-61-4. Once again, the head-to-head was the reason Doosan, it looks like, got the uh, three seed instead of the four. Doosan won that first game, so ultimately uh, they advanced two games to none into the semifinals to face off with the KT Wiz. The KT Wiz went 81 62 and 1, which was a half a game better than the Doosan Bears. And this is where the first upset happened. The Doosan Bears in the best of five. Already starting down one nothing. They won the series three games to one against the KT Wiz. So uh, the Doosan Bears then face off against the NC Dinos, who won the regular season. Uh, let's see here. They had a record of 83-55-6 for a 601 winning percentage. And where are we currently at in the Korean series? This is the first best of seven. And as of recording here, Wednesday night, game five, will be Thursday night at 4.30 or 5.30 a.m. So if you guys are up bright and early out there, tune on ESPN. You can catch Game 5 of the KBO World Series. But the Dinos and Bears are tied two games apiece. So we have ourselves a a nice little series coming down here in the Korean Series. But uh, shout-out to all of these guys. This, uh, This league, once again, just to remind you guys, 144 games. And the entire league was going to shut down with one positive coronavirus case. This was uh, during conversation with Major League Baseball. Well, how are they going to contain things? What are they going to do? Well, the KBO said, we're not messing around, and one positive case is going to shut everything down. So they did a fantastic job there in South Korea. Uh, They since added fans as they continued through the regular season, but uh, with the recent increase in virus cases, not only here in America, but throughout the world, they've since tightened up on some of the restrictions. Uh, so there will be limited fans for the Korean series games five and six, and then potentially seven over the next three days here. So games five, six, and seven will be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the KBO will crown a champion by this weekend. But uh, let's look at potentially some individual performances here. Who were the top five batting, pitching? Let's see if we could recognize some names for who we were talking about uh, a few months back here. But your average leader was uh, Choi Hyung Woo for Kia. 
He hit 354 this year. Uh, Son Ah Siop hit 352. Rojas Mel Jr., who was uh, just off of winning the Triple Crown. So uh, Mel Rojas Jr. hit 349, five points away from winning the batting title. He was first in the league in home runs with 47 this year for KT. And then uh, he was first in RBIs with 135. So fantastic year for him. Uh, of course, this is his first year over in KT. Or excuse me, this is his fourth year in, in KT. He's hit 301, 305, 322, and now 349. Uh, and he's had home run marks of 43 and again 47 this year. So it looks like uh, Mel Rojas Jr. has certainly found success over in the KBO and is somebody that continues to perform. But uh, who else in home runs? Roberto Ramos. He hit 38 in his first year with the LG Twins. Uh, he hit 278, 38 home runs on the year. Uh, so really hitting for power. And then you had Na Sung Bum hitting, uh, let's see here, 34 home runs to finish third in the KBO this year. Your top RBI guys. G.E. Yang, 124, in second place behind Mel Rojas. You had Su Kim Hu hitting 119, 119 RBIs. And uh, let's see, that'll do it here. So let's transition over to pitching. See these guys at the top of the list. Who do we got? Eric Jokish was the top guy in ERA. Uh, he had a 2-1-4 ERA uh, for this year for the Key Woom Heroes. Uh, this was his second year over in Korea. He had a 3-1-3 ERA last year, so he's been effective both years over in uh, KBO. Uh, Dan Straley finished second with a 2-5-0 ERA. So uh, Dan's first year with the Lotte Giants, 31 games. He went 15-4 and with a 2-5-0 ERA. And is this one of those instances where Straley – you know, goes over to Korea, has himself a fantastic summer, and now finds another opportunity stateside here because he's had time in the major leagues with the Orioles in the past. And, you know, or is it just a competition level thing? And uh, he'll remain over in Korea and stay comfortable over there. But uh, the KBO, they had one twenty game winner. It was Raul Alcantara with the Doosan Bears. He found himself this year going 20 and 2 with a 254 ERA and this was a, a huge uptick from 2019 he spent with the KT ball club over there he had 27 games to a 401 ERA so went from 401 to 254 and, and a fantastic upgrade uh Drew Resinski for the NC Dinos he had 19 wins uh, he was effective in his second year both years in 30 games he has identical 3.05 earned run averages, which is kind of fascinating. Gave up 62 earned runs this year and uh, 60 last year. So a few different innings and you get the same ERA. Really, really fascinating. So uh, from a saves perspective, let's see. Sang Woo Chu had 33 saves for Ki Woom. Uh, Hyung Won Jung had 30 for NC Dinos. And then uh, Wong Jun Kim had 35 for the Lotte Giants and the KBO, they all uh, they they look at holds as well, not just saves. I'm impressed over here. Ju Kwan had 31 for KT. Uh, Jun Lee Young had 35 for Ki Woom, and then uh, the top strikeout guy was Dan Straley with 205. Uh, coming in on the top of that list here as well. So uh, the KBO, it's it's fun to watch, man. I, I mean, it's fun to uh, to look after. They're in their finals now, the Korean series. So if you guys are still clamoring for baseball out there, you didn't get enough during the 60-game regular season, and even with the expanded postseason and everything that Major League Baseball had to offer, uh, you could check out the Korean League. I believe it's going to be on ESPN. Over the next couple of days, I mean, once again, I'm Eastern Standard Time, and I think it's 4.30 a.m. Eastern kicking off. So if you're on the West Coast, if you're uh, out there closer to the GSMC headquarters, you guys are catching it at about 1.30. So before you go to bed for Monday morning, turn on ESPN, and you can check out Game 5, 6, and 7 over the next couple of days here. But uh, that'll do it here for the third segments. I appreciate you guys coming along the ride with me. 
talking KBO. We're going to continue to have some fun in our fourth and final segment, and we're going to talk about the Nippon Professional Baseball League over in Japan and where they're at. They're actually in their finals as well. So uh, who performed well, where are they at? We'll wrap things up having that conversation once we get back here for a word from one of our sponsors and one of our sister shows. So I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. As always, this is the GSMC Baseball Podcast. We'll be right back. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League, we've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. back to the fourth and final segment of today's episode the gsmc baseball podcast brought to you by the gsmc podcast network thanks again for listening everyone i do appreciate it we're having some fun here in the fourth and final segment and really in that third segment as well for our international listeners out there we appreciate you guys wherever you're listening from podcast not only domestic here in the u.s but also across the globe internationally so hopefully you guys listening uh, across the seas out there are, are enjoying our conversation around the KBO and now the Japan Professional Baseball League. So uh, what's going on over in Japan? You know, where are we at? Let's update ourselves. Let's touch base. And uh, the Japanese League, they only play 120 games uh, instead of the 144 we just talked about in the KBO. And uh, the Japanese Baseball League is one step above the KBO. And Really, where do we look at things comparatively speaking? And and I'm probably going to upset some people listening uh, across the pond over there. But uh, in regards to, you know, domestically, the levels, well, the KBO is kind of looked at as double A competition here in the U.S. So guys who go over there who struggle in the big leagues, you know, have success in triple A, go to the KBO, have success and they kind of portray that as double-A competition. Well, the Japan uh, Professional League is triple-A, and then the Major Leagues, uh, of course, is the Major Leagues. And, you know, that's where all those hits Ichiro had. He then came over to Major League Baseball and had all of those hits. So, of course, people who can play in Japan will be able to play in the Major Leagues, but it's not going to be everybody. And that's what we've seen uh, sometimes from a lot of these top guys who sign and come over. Yes, they have success, but maybe not to the point where we've seen or, or we expect it. I mean, the likes of Shohei Otani recently coming over as a dual uh, dual threat guy. You know, he hits and he pitches. He's going to be the next Babe Ruth. He's going to do both at the big league level, throw every five days, hit in between. Injuries have since taken him off course of, uh, you know, everybody knows the the deal, but uh, you Darvish has been affected, but he, he's also had his problems in the postseason, his time with the Dodgers, his struggles on the big stage. You have Marsha Hiro Tanaka, similar conversation with the Yankees. He's been good, not great, so depending on where your expectations were, is kind of depending on how your feelings are. So guys are going to be able to play, and it is really good baseball, but it's just a, a step below uh, the big leagues for you know you guys listening who don't really know anything about uh, what's going on in the Nippon professional baseball season. So uh, two different divisions, and when it comes to the regular season, you have the Central League and the Pacific League, and three teams make the playoffs combined out of both leagues, and I'm not exactly sure why, who, or how when it comes to what's going on here, but uh, just looking at the Pacific League, uh, they had two playoff teams. The first-ranked Fukoa SoftBank Hawks, they took on the Chiba Lote Mariners. Uh, the Hawks, they had a 73-42-5 record for a 635 winning percentage. So uh, that's a that's a pretty good season 
finishing at a 635 winning percentage. Uh, I'm trying to pull up, you know, the Dodgers winning percentage just for comparison's sake because theirs was obviously at an all-time high. I'll wait for my internet to load here. Uh, here we go. The L.A. Dodgers, they were at 717, and the Rays were at 667. So the uh, the Hawks at 635. Uh, certainly it makes you understand kind of how they were, uh, you know, against the rest of the league. And then on the other side, you have the Central League, where the Yamayori Giants were the number one seed at 67-45-8. And then you have the Hanshin Tigers at 60-53-7. But how do the playoffs break down? Is it as complicated as the KBO? Is there as much going on? And the uh, the short answer is no. But the long answer, kind of looking at everything, uh, is maybe. But uh, no, there's really two different series, right? So you have the Pacific League Climax Series, which pinned the uh, Fukuoka SoftBank Hawks against the Chiba Lote Mariners. And it's basically who who, to be decided who was the champion of the Pacific League. And the Hawks swept that series three games to none. Now, once again, they did start with a one to nothing lead in that series because looking at it here, the Hawks only won two games back to back. And of course, the attendance in these games, just under 20,000. So Japan is having fans at these games. Korea was having fans at these games. And of course, the U.S., we finally allowed fans into the World Series, but I don't believe it was upwards of almost 20,000 for these uh, games here in the Pei Dome over in Japan. So uh, the Hawks won the series then by a total of three games to nothing, which puts them up against the Yomiuri Giants to face off against the Hawks. And as of recording here, once again, the Hawks actually won today by a score of 13 to two. The Hawks took game one by a score of five to one game two, 13 to two and games three through seven will be taking place over the course of the next week. It looks like uh, the 24th, 25th, 26th will be in the Pepe Dome. That's the home of the uh, Foco, uh, Foco Ua SoftBank Hawks. Since uh, the first two games they won were actually on the road at the Yomayuri Giants. So uh, the Hawks, they certainly look to be taking it here. Uh, they had the best regular season out of any team, the most wins. And they're continuing to uh, show their dominance in the postseason, having gone 4-0. and thus far in four games. So uh, it'll be fascinating to see if they just sweep through the postseason. But uh, let's look at here uh, some statistics, where everybody stands, top guys. Once again, uh, Japan breaks them down by league, right? So they have Central League and Pacific League. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of razzle-dazzle here and give you guys the the, the tops uh, across the entire league and not one or the other. So uh, when it comes to batting average, uh, Masokaka Yoshidi, he was your top guy. He hit 350 in 120 games. Uh, Yo- Yokui Yanganita was right behind him at 342. Uh, Kensuke Kondu hit 340. All three of these guys were members of the Pacific League. Uh, then we have to go over here uh, to the Central League where it was Kita Sanu and Takoyuki Kachitana hitting 328 and 323 to be your top five average guys in the Japanese league. And uh, looking at home runs, uh, I can't filter it by home runs. So kind of scrolling through here, we had Hideto Asumura hit 32, 32 home runs, 104 RBIs. Uh, That is second in the league. Uh, Sho Nakata had 108 RBIs for the Pacific league, which was tops on that side and tops across uh, all of baseball, those two were the top two at 108 and 104. I just want to make sure, yeah, there was a gentleman at 97. That was Kazama Okamoto in the uh, Central League that had 97 RBI. So your top home run guy, 32, like I said, Hidito Asuyama. And Sho Nakata had 31 right behind him. And then you had Yoki Yaganita with 29 home runs at the top of the list. So your top three home run guys and your top three average guys, both coming from the Pacific league and a couple of them coming from uh, SoftBank and the Hawks. So uh, certainly shows why they had uh, themselves uh, a good year offensively, especially a Yaganita. He hit 342 with 29 home runs and 86 
RBIs. That's a fantastic year for him offensively. But let's look at some starting pitching. Uh, let's see here, or, or, you know, pitchers in general. Uh, once again, they split these guys up by Pacific League and Central League. Uh, your leader in ERA uh, across starting pitching was Yodai Ono. He went. Uh, he had a 182 ERA, went 11 and six in 20 starts this year with 10 complete games. So it uh, just goes to show kind of the difference in baseball philosophy as well. I mean, your leader in complete games this year in Major League Baseball had to be two, three at most. And, you know, here you have no putting together 10 complete games. Now, the next guy on the list was at four. So it certainly goes to show Ono's dominance comparative to the rest of the league. But even a guy at 4-3-3 here uh, certainly looks like uh, the Japanese style of baseball is to let the starting pitchers in uh, a little bit longer than, uh, you know, Major League Baseball stateside. So uh, on the other side, the gentleman had three complete games. So it really is an outlier on what Yodai Ono did. Uh, Go and start to finish 10 times in the Japanese league. Very impressive. Uh, Masato Morshahida had a 191 ERA after going 10 and 3 this year. And uh, Tamoyuki Sugano had a 197 ERA and finished 14 and 2 for an 875 winning percentage. So three starters in the Central League, ERAs under two. And uh, nobody on the Pacific League side of things. So uh, that certainly makes sense. We talked about how the offense on the Pacific side had the top three home run, top three RBI, and top three average guys. And uh, that's why the Pacific League, which they play against each other until the postseason, that's why the ERAs and the pitching side of things are a bit higher and, and vice versa on the Central League. I mean, you die oh no, has 10 complete games, a 182 ERA, And uh, that's why offensively there weren't as many guys or as uh, gaudy stats to discuss here. So uh, winning percentage on this side of things, we had Hideki Wakui for the Pacific League finish 11-4 and and have the highest winning percentage. But uh, they break things down with uh, starters, top closers, and top set-uppers. So top set-up guys, they have their own breakdown, but uh, top closers here, Robert Suarez had 25 saves to leave the central side of things. Um, Tashuiri Musada had 33 saves to lead the Pacific League. Yuido Mori had 32. Noayo Musada had 31. So top three closers on that side. Uh, then you get over to the uh, central side of things with a lot of guys in the 20s, which certainly, again, based on performance, makes sense. But uh, let's see here. Let's look at strikeouts. Uh, Yoga Kodai Senega led it with 149 on the Pacific side of things. And, of course, Yudayo No had 148 on the central side, uh, throwing all those innings for him. But uh, top setup, guys, let's see here as we're wrapping up today's show, the Pacific side of things, Levon Moleno with a 169 ERA in 50 games. Kayamai Tahira had a 187 ERA in 54 games. And Rai Takahishi had a 2.65 ERA in 52 games. So uh, those were your top three names effective on the Pacific side of things. And then lastly, here on the central side, we had Dasuke Sobui at a 1.79 ERA. Sogoro Isuyaka, 1.82. And Yohi Tasunaki at 1.93 having the lowest ERAs from the setup side of things. But uh, it certainly looks like the SoftBank Hawks are going to win the Japanese League. Like I said, they're 4-0 thus far in the playoffs. And uh, games 3, 4, 5, and potentially 6 coming up over the course of the next couple of days. And uh, I don't think those are on television stateside, so you may have to do some diving via the internet, via the web. But I know on Twitter I can usually find a a live feed to the Japanese leagues, and with uh, all the streaming services and everything going on, I think you may be able to find those. And the timing may be better for those of you who don't want to get up at 4.30 or 1.30 a.m. Eastern to check out the Korean League based on where you're at. But... That'll do it for today's episode. Once again, I appreciate you guys listening in. I have a lot of fun bringing you guys these episodes every Monday and Thursday. 
I'll ask you one last time here. Be a friend. Tell a friend. Share us with somebody if you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, reach out. Send a text. Continue to spread the word. Please rate and review. Leave a comment. Uh, that does go a long way. I know I ask you guys every episode, uh, but that uh, picks up Apple's algorithm behind the scenes and allows us to check the box, You know, do what we got to do to continue to uh, head into the top trending, up and coming, news and noteworthy, all of that type of good stuff, as well as uh, the show social media shares. Uh, go a a long way to helping us out here. But uh, a lot going across Major League Baseball. I know we talked about a lot here in today's episode. Right off the top, we talked about Lance Lynn. I think he's going to get traded. Where does he end up? Padres, White Sox, Angels are the top three rumors we're hearing across the board. Uh, We discussed Nolan Arenado. Is he really going to end up with the Dodgers? And and even if it's not this offseason via trade, Is it really going to happen next offseason in free agency? I mean, the stars align much more than, you know, I had originally thought uh, until I did some research and some of my own digging into potentially this moving forward. So Arenado to the Dodgers, a possibility. Lindor, where does he go? J.A. Happ, he's being pursued by a lot of guys. And, of course, your top free agents, Real Muto, Springer, Bauer, uh, they continue to be rumored all across Uh, different uh, towns, cities, and teams. But uh, that does it for today's episode. Once again, rate and review. Check us out. But I appreciate you guys listening. I'm your host, Kevin Mahalik. I'll talk to you guys again Thursday. This is the GSMC Baseball Podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also find Follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.